Okay, so our first presenter is Siobhan Foley. She is the Director of Education and Outreach at the California Center for Sustainable Energy, or CCSE, where she provides strategic leadership for the center's many marketing, education, and outreach initiatives, including trans transition of the Energy Upgrade California into the state's comprehensive energy management, education, and engagement campaign for residential and small business consumers. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I actually am talking sort of more broadly, and I'm not really talking into the microphone like I'm supposed to be. Is that okay? Uh, so um, we're going to talk about some particular programs uh, with the other panelists. And I was asked to talk a little bit more broadly about outreach in general. Uh, and so how many of you do outreach as part of your normal course of business? Everyone. Okay. Well, then I guarantee you I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know. Um, but I thought it would be really helpful to step back a bit and kind of go back to basics and think a little bit about what really makes successful outreach. And the, the title here, you know, Outreach is the Original Social Media, I think we hear a lot of buzz these days, social media, and there's all kinds of new tactics and channels that we're always hearing about. And I think we sometimes forget about the value of some good old-fashioned outreach. And so I want to talk about why outreach can be so valuable and some of the things that we can do with it. So a little bit about CCSC before I move on. Um, so CCSC is uh, an organization based in San Diego. We actually have staff in the Bay Area and Los Angeles. And we were founded originally as the San Diego Regional Energy Office. We've done a lot of outreach throughout the San Diego community. We uh, managed a program with sdg &E for about 10 years, where we hosted about 85,000 people at our center and about 15,000 people in workshops. We've also done a lot of different types of community outreach. Uh, essentially, this is kind of our focus. This is kind of the, the whole of what we do. We focus in three areas, building performance, including energy efficiency, renewables, and clean transportation. So we actually manage the state's program for rebates for zero emission vehicles. Um, we work on the California Solar Initiative program. We've worked a lot on Energy Upgrade California. And this is just kind of some of the brands we support, some of the agencies we've worked with, and some of the things that we do. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about just outreach in general. And sort of thinking about what outreach really is and how social it really is and why that's such a key part of its value. And then I just want to talk sort of, I tried to really distill this down. And again, it's kind of a back to basics idea. But some of the, these are some of the things that I think often in the mad scramble to launch the new program or do the new initiative or get out the door with whatever sort of event you might be having or other types of outreach you might be doing with your constituents. We kind of forget sometimes, I think, some of these basic building blocks. So I try to distill it down to kind of three key areas that I think are really uh, integral for successful outreach. And then I want to talk a little bit about the Energy Upgrade California transition uh, at the end. So I'm going to actually go through these in, in detail. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, this seems quite self-evident, meet people where they are. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. So actually be physically where people are, but also kind of find out kind of where they are mentally in terms of where you want to bring them. And use the opportunity to actually be having this two-way dialogue that outreach affords you that other types of channels do not. So go where they go. So create or find opportunities. So at CCSC, we actually have been doing outreach a very long time, and we spent a lot of time when we had the center, and we don't actually have the physical center in the same way anymore. sdg &E has opened a new innovation center um, that we do programming at. Uh, and we've actually sort of taken that opportunity to really get more out into the community. So we used to do a lot of events at the center, and we used to try to, the center was really geared at, at market actors. So it was really more of a business to business, primarily business to business function. And we would try to bring residents and homeowners in, and we would have a lot of events on weekends and sort of other places. And where we were located, it's sort of this business park area of San Diego. Um, it was a great deal of work to put on these massive events and get people to come. And we'll talk a little bit at the end, the, the last tip really about partnering, which I think is totally critical to success for any outreach effort. And we did a lot of partnering, but it was still on us primarily to get people to come. And we would have on average 500 to 1,000 people at any of these events. And those were a hard one, 500 to 1,000 people. And it was just a tremendous, tremendous amount of work. So we've actually moved away from doing these kind of standalone events uh, and sort of moving out into doing more frequent, smaller events with more broad partnerships. So. This is kind of more of a sense of the variety of things we're doing today. And I just took a screenshot of our Flickr account. We have lots of great photos of all kinds of things that we're, we've got going on. 
And we're trying to do a lot more in the community. So in about 2010, we really took a concerted effort to do that. And we developed, actually, this was a, an event I was particularly uh, proud of, where we actually did kind of a comprehensive neighborhood um, kind of multifaceted event, where we had workshops in a local church. We did a, sort of a small fair in a park. And then we actually did home tours. We had five um, residents. And it, they were comprehensive home tours. So they weren't energy efficiency and they weren't solar. They had, we had residents who had done all kinds of things. We had one guy who had actually installed his own solar thermal and PV. Um, we had other folks who had done sort of other sorts of things. Uh, and we also incorporated uh, landscaping and some other things. And we made it as relevant as we could. This is a historic neighborhood. It's Kensington in San Diego. It's a very, um, people have historic historically registered homes. So we actually partnered with, um, this is the SOHO, I think that's what they're called, um, the Society of Historical, I don't know, actually, does anybody from San Diego, do you remember the, the designation? I should know that. Anyway, they actually participated with our workshop um, with us and talked very specifically about how you do energy efficiency improvements in historic residents. So really trying to focus the message for the people who lived in the neighborhood. Um, we do a lot of stuff now where we, we have a, a trailer that we take out on the road. Um, it's about 24 feet. And um, we actually have two of them. And the city of Chula Vista uh, is actually using the first one. Uh, and they have it in a station. Well, I think they're taking it on the road as well um, within Chula Vista. And then we have a second one that we developed that we've taken out around the state and we take around the region. And so we take that to various places. And then we also do sort of other types of community events. And the key thing here is different things work for different neighborhoods, and we've certainly learned that. And I do think outreach is a lot of, it's trial and error. So the most important thing, of course, is to be relevant, and that's just true of good marketing. And it's a challenge. I mean, I think that's often, if there's one piece that gets lost the most, I think it really is trying to sit down in some sort of sense of calm as you're planning various sort of efforts and think, OK, who am I really trying to talk to here, and what do I really want to tell them? <laughs> Um, and you know, and open the door on that. It would be really good. So, um, segmenting and targeting is critical. It's critical for any type of any kind of marketing outreach, etc. Really, kind of figuring out what your audience is concerned about. What's keeping them from doing the action that you want them to take? What could you convey to them that might get them over that hurdle? And really thinking about that messaging, and then targeting that messaging, and then the. The most fantastic thing about outreach is that you can adjust pretty quickly. Be attractive, interactive, and fun, right? So of course, you know, people don't like to be, um, be sort of spoken to, right? They want to have kind of an interaction, and they want to sort of learn themselves. So we have this energy efficiency bike that we use. Um, it's really very good at conveying the realities of the differences in effort expended, right? So it's got the LEDs and the incandescent and the CFLs, and then it's got a hair dryer and a fan. And the hair dryer is near impossible. Like, no one, I don't care how strong you are, you cannot pedal fast enough to get that hair dryer to go. And it really does start the wheels turning, and people kind of go, oh, OK. So anytime you can have demonstrations or interactivity that actually lets people discover what you want them to discover on their own, all the better. And then give people something very clear to do. Give them a call to action. So often, I think, with outreach programs, what winds up happening is we, we lose sight of the, the fact that it is actually not just a conversation, that you actually are trying to compel people to do something. So really think about what is that thing you want to leave them with. And maybe break it down. So if you want them to do something very big and very expensive, maybe instead of get a home upgrade today, it's make, a, you know, make an appointment for an assessment, or come to a workshop, or Follow up online and get more information. Like try different things to figure out what people will really be willing to do. And that gets to making conversation not a speech. Outreach is unique in that it's not a mass market media. It's not other things where you're really kind of just putting information out there. You actually get to have the give and take, which is the most valuable aspect of outreach, in my opinion. So we consider it one-to-one -one marketing, and we track it that way. So we really do track on uh, leads generated and conversion rates and other things based on our outreach efforts. Uh, but we, we sort of, and we adjust based on kind of how, how we find things are working. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so conversational time. You really can sort of hear from people. And then you can document that. So we document both quantitatively and qualitatively. So we have quantitative things that we check on every outreach event. And then we have qualitative things that we think about in relation to a specific engagement with certain community members in any given event, where we kind of learn where people are. And again, listening is as important to talk as talking. And doing actual research as part of your outreach. So 
in terms of going back to being relevant and knowing your message, the more you can do research in advance of launching some sort of outreach campaign, the better. And it doesn't have to be super expensive. Surveys can be pretty inexpensive. We actually often do kind of quasi-focus groups. So they're not really true focus groups. We don't sort of sit behind windows and we don't have professional facilitators. But we'll bring people in and our staff actually will just sit down and talk about sort of different things in order to kind of hone our message. And if you don't have time for that, or you, or you find that that is still too expensive, actually doing intercept surveys in the process of doing the outreach can be very effective. And you can both, it's both then a marketing channel and also a research channel, and that makes it sort of a greater return on investment too, and I think easier to justify the effort expended. So I talked a little bit about this, but qualitatively and quantitatively. So I think it's also really important. Outreach can often be small numbers of high quality. And sometimes it can be large numbers of not high quality. And sometimes when you're really lucky, it's large numbers of high quality. But there is, it's really important not to get too fixated on one measurement or the other. And I think having a balance is really important because you are, you are dealing with people and you are getting interesting information. And the qualitative piece is really critical to, to using that information. Because if you don't sort of document some of the stuff you learn from the outreach, then I think you're, you're missing a huge opportunity to, to use it. And again, so quality interactions really drive greater impact per person. So we do these demo, and I haven't actually talked about some of the things that the photos are of. So we do a demonstration home program, um, actually, that we do in partnership with the city of Chula Vista. And we've actually, it was such a, a good partnership from the ARA period that we've expanded it throughout the region. And we're now doing um, some of it in partnership with SDG&E and other uh, municipalities. And we bring a contractor. Uh, and I think, I'm sure there are, I, I know there are lots of programs that are run like this around the state. And it's really critical to bring the contractor because that expert opportunity is, it's, it's helpful too also to familiarize consumers with contractors and that they can be trusted sources of information and sort of bridge that gap. So this is an eye chart, but basically this is just an example of some of the ways that we track. So we have this roadshow tool, we have discount assessments, um, and we also tend, we, we bring homeowners, so we do these home tours of a home, an actual home, and we find that that's actually the most critical piece. So letting other people kind of tell your story for you, especially people who've experienced it, is of course the most valuable gold there is really in this channel. But so we track kind of, if we've used each of these tools, um, we track headcount, we track leads uh, generated, referrals generated, we track conversion of that, and then we track sort of how we got people to come to the event. And that, getting people to come to the event is of course kind of the other huge piece. And the easiest way that we found to do that, well, easy isn't really the right word, the most productive and effective way we found to do that is really through partnership and really smart partnerships um, and really kind of finding ways to work together with other organizations to pool efforts. Um, that's, I mean, getting people in the door is really still like the critical piece to really making outreach successful. Uh, we do a lot of work with the um, Clean Vehicle Rebate Project throughout the state. We do a lot of workshops, and we found that partnerships in particular, especially coming from San Diego and going to lots of different communities throughout the state, it's absolutely critical. We took our roadshow on tour back in November, and we had some terrific partnerships with a lot of local entities. And without those partnerships, nobody would have seen what we were doing, and it wouldn't have been as effective. And it, w it really, those partnerships are just absolutely crucial. I can't state that enough. And there's the roadshow. So, my call to action for today um, is just a, a brief invitation to, to let you know a little bit about what's planned with the Energy Upgrade California transition and that um, we are really looking to work with local governments throughout the state over the next year. So I'm going to talk a little bit, this is a little bit into the hypothetical right now. There is not, this is pending a commission decision. Um, so we have proposed a lot of tactics and um, we're working with a larger team that includes all of the investor-owned utilities and the regional energy networks. Um, and we've got sort of a plan of what we'd like to do. And we're hoping for commission approval sometime in the next couple of months. And once we have some decision that sort of says what we can do, we'll be actually rolling out more. So I'm just going to talk really briefly. How many of you are familiar with Energy Upgrade California beyond just randomly? Well, so how many of you are familiar with it? You've heard of it. How many of you know more about it than you've just heard of it? Excellent. Okay. So this is actually important, I think, to communicate a little bit about the transition because I think there's some confusion and I've got one minute. Okay. So Energy Upgrade California was developed under ARA to promote home upgrades. 
um, and all the various programs everybody was doing. Um, we are expanding its mission to talk more specifically. So we're building on the collaborative effort that was developed, and we want to communicate the broad value proposition of demand-side management writ large. So home upgrades remain a very critical part of that, but then also a lot of other aspects of what consumers, um, residential and small business consumers, can do to manage their energy more effectively. Uh, and I'll keep going because you can read that. So as I mentioned, we're pending a decision. Um, we do have a website in development. We are making some small changes to the current website that will go live probably the end of this month. Very small changes um, just to kind of broaden it, make the rebate finder a little bit more um, easier to find and some, some other sort of components. And then we're, we're in development on a new website. Um, and as I mentioned, the whole house programs remain a part of the brand portfolio. And this is kind of an eye chart too, but it's just sort of helpful, I think, to understand the transitional phases. So the 2011-2013 period was really the ARA period. The 2013-2014 period is really this expansion of scope. And the 2015 and beyond will be really kind of heading more towards the umbrella brand that's been envisioned by the PUC. And so um, we are going to be looking for local governments to work with us. We don't have an offering yet because we don't have a decision, and so we don't have a program. Um, but we have some plans to have ways for you to plug into the campaign and work with us on a local level um, alongside your local government partnerships and with your utility partners. So this would be complementary um, and will be kind of probably more initiative-based. Uh, and we'll have more on that when we launch. And so I am just looking for folks to um, let me know if you're interested in hearing more when we launch. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, ne next up to talk about a rural example of business outreach in Humboldt County is Matthew Marshall. He is the Executive Director of Redwood Coast Energy Authority. A graduate of Humboldt State University, Matthew previously served as the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Program Administrator for the City and County of Denver, where he was responsible for developing and managing programs and community partnerships in support of Denver's Climate Action Plan. All right, I am gonna talk about um what we do on the, the rural small business side of uh, program implementation and outreach. And so we manage a direct install program through an Energy Watch partnership. And the, the small business piece of it has really been kind of the, the core activity. And so the getting to that direct install level of actually doing projects, how do we get there? And what's kind of the whole package that we provide? So I'm just going to kind of cover sort of the, the setting that we're working in and some of the challenges that we face. And I think a lot of those challenges are, are, some of them are unique to rural, and a lot of them are just kind of across the board, um, small business challenges in general. Um, but maybe those are, are amplified in some cases in a rural setting. And then I'm going to kind of talk about the, the program design that we use to kind of address those different challenges and um, factors that, that affect rural businesses. And then talk about um, some of the, the specifics of the implementation that we do and the, the outcomes. And I was asked to kind of actually give us, you know, some budget numbers and staffing so that people could kind of say, well, what would it take to, to replicate something like that in a different community? So the, the setting is, is up in Humboldt County, which if you're not familiar, we're about I don't know, five and a half hours uh, from Sacramento uh, up on the coast. And it's, it's very scenic, but it's, it's a small population. We've got about 135,000 people, and it's fairly spread out. Most of them are concentrated around the, the Humboldt Bay area. And so scenic, but, but pretty remote from, from any population centers. You know, it's, it's a long way to the Bay Area. It's a long way to Sacramento. And so that, that plays into to kind of um, a key challenge for us which was, you know, how do we develop a, a local program to, to reach our community? We're kind of a, an underserved area, and historically there wasn't a, a lot of participation in utility programs, you know, certainly third-party providers. It's a, it's a long way to, to come up to Humboldt County, and, you know, especially for small businesses, you know, we don't have a lot of large customers up there. There's a couple mills and, you know, a, a few larger entities, but, you know, the vast majority are in, in the small business category. And so there just wasn't a lot of um, exposure to programs, and, and there wasn't a lot of uptake. And so we wanted to, to, to develop something locally in our region, and the, the question came, well, how do we do that? How do we get to, you know, sort of a scale that can actually be implemented at the local government level? And how do we kind of build that local implementation capacity so that we actually have um, some, some local resources? And then there's kind of just the, the standard small business um, capacity limitations as far as, you know, they're busy running their, their pizza shop or whatever it is, and, you know, that's a 30-hour-a-day job for them. And so, you know, they don't have a lot of money. They're, a lot of time they're just looking to, you know, make the next payroll or, you know, make a, a rent payment. And so time and money and then information, 
not being experts on energy efficiency. You know, they don't have a facility manager who can research programs, who can who can dive into you know different technology options for their facility or what would be the most efficient technology. And so, really, those limitations of of time and monetary resources, as well as just knowing what what makes sense for their business, um, are pretty. I would say consistent across most small businesses, and that's not just a, a rural c condition. Um, there's sort of the, the skepticism worldview piece of it. You know, our area is kind of pretty diverse in, in the sense that we have, you know, conservative kind of communities and, and fairly liberal communities. It's a, it's a mix, but in general, rural probably tends to be more on the conservative side. And I think there's also a bit of an independent streak, you know, kind of especially among small business owners, you know, they, they went out there and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be my own boss. And, you know, so I think there's a tendency to be kind of independent and not necessarily looking like, oh, okay, what's this program about? And, you know, is this really um, something that's going to benefit me, you know, is this a sales pitch? What's what's the goal of this? And you know, particularly, you know, government programs can be a, a challenge to to sell to folks um, if they've got that skepticism or it doesn't really fit in with, you know, if climate change isn't a priority for them. How do you how do you address that? You know, how do you frame it in a way that that you know resonates with what their priorities are? Um, and then just limited access to providers and equipment, and not just sort of energy efficiency providers, but even just um, vendors and distributors, you know, we don't have a Home Depot, we don't have a Lowe's, let alone, you know, um, a, a large selection of, like, providers for high efficiency products or, or vendors that focus their business. You know, we don't have contractors that are in the efficiency business for the most part. Um, you know, it's a lot of, you know, one-man operations or, you know, medium-sized small firms that, that are kind of doing a, a breadth of activities, and so there isn't sort of that specialization um, inherent in the community. So to kind of, I'm going to go through these and kind of talk about the different pieces that, that we've used to, to address that. And so as far as the program scale and how do we build that local implementation capacity, the first thing was that our local governments got together and form, formed our organization, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, which is a, a regional joint powers. And as was mentioned this morning, Pat Stoner was kind of instrumental in getting that going back in 2003 through a CPUC funded pilot. So Pat's kind of the, the father of, of RCEA. And so we, we certainly have um, been appreciative of his efforts. And so that was kind of the key piece. I mean, our local governments are all small. I mean, that population is spread out amongst nine jurisdictions. You know, the smallest is like 300 people up to the biggest city is like 28,000 people. So. Um, I think one of our member entities has a half-time energy specialist position, and so none of the, the local governments have, like, the internal, I mean, a lot of them have, like, part-time city managers, let alone energy staff. And so the goal was to say, well, okay, let's work together as, as a region and join forces and have an energy office that can support um, all of our member entities and have that economy of scale where we can actually have staff working with all of our jurisdictions um, and, you know, have that be um, not just sort of a, an economy of scale as far as being the, the right size to be able to actually have a, a sustainable program, but also to kind of build that staffing capacity so it isn't like, okay, we're going to hire a consultant to do this one time and then, you know, it gets done, you know, maybe for one project, but to actually kind of build knowledge and kind of build program expertise and, you know, have some continuity um, within, you know, the, the service of providing energy efficiency um, upgrades for both municipal as well as residential and commercial uh, customers. So the, the skepticism and, and worldview, you know, there's the saying that the 10 scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> and, and I think that's very much true in, in rural, small business communities that, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of skepticism of, well, where is this coming from? Who's paying for this? And so for, for us, you know, the, the tactics we use is a lot of just on the ground, um, face-to-face outreach and repeated, repeated contact. So, you know, kind of being there, being in the community, um, talking with folks, um, you know, and building traction, you know, the, I think, you know, we've seen, it usually takes us at least three or four touches on somebody before they actually sign an application to, to take services. And so, you know, being at events, being at a chamber mixer, they hear about it from a friend, you know, having that kind of word of mouth and, you know, kind of slowly but surely kind of building up over time the trust that people are kind of looking for to, to actually you know, believe that it's something that's that's in their best interest. You know, a, a local forest service uh, employee said that they were talking to some local tribal members, 
and they said, how do I, how do I get your trust? How do I get you to kind of like welcome me into the community and, and be a partner with you? And they said, ask me again in 10 years and I'll answer that. And, and that's really, you know, you kind of got to be there. And that's, you know, something that was particularly a challenge with out of area providers and, and programs that don't have that kind of, you know, oh, this is my neighbor. These are, these are folks that I know and I'm comfortable with. And then being a, a joint powers agency, we kind of have politically diverse leadership because, like I said, our, our towns are not all on the same page as far as, you know, we've got board members that are from the Green Party and the, the Tea Party. And somebody said, oh, you should call it the, the Green Tea Party. But, um, <laughs> And, and so that does give us traction, though, in the sense that, you know, we've got community leaders that are from the full spectrum of, you know, political backgrounds or, or perspectives. And so we kind of, you know, are able to, to frame that message and customize it and engage them on kind of, you know, engaging the businesses and convincing them that this is something that's actually in the interest of, of their constituents. And so reaching out through, through our political leaders that, you know, wouldn't be the traditional supporters of a, a government energy efficiency program. Uh, as far as the, the capacity limitations, you know, the face-to-face the -face outreach, you know, was mentioned, you know, going to where they're at, and it's like going into the, you know, the, the business, figuring out what's the best time. If it's a restaurant, you know, maybe it's kind of, you know, after the lunch rush or somewhere in there to, to talk to them, to, to kind of, you know, make it as easy as possible. You know, don't expect them to come in and, and you know, during the middle of the day and fill out an application at your office between, you know, 9 and 5 or come to you for an appointment to, you know, to go out and actually um, meet them where they're at. And we use a lot of uh, sort of foot in the door measures, like freebies, like you know, uh, for example, LED uh, open signs, and say, hey, would you like a LED open sign? It'll save you this much. We can swap it out for free. It's you know, no cost, and and, and some other kinds of measures that kind of are you know basically a, a marketing channel. They, they get energy savings as well, but to to use those to kind of uh, grease the wheels and say, hey, here's something. You know, it's it's a it's an offering. You know, there's no, there's no upfront cost to that. And you can kind of use it as a way to, to gain a little bit of traction. Um, as far as the, the turnkey nature of our program, that's the second piece is that we kind of provide start to finish pro project management. So we've got a, a pool of contractors that we actually work with that are local electricians and, and vendors. And so we actually will go in, we'll do a, a free assessment, we'll provide a report. And then we can, you know, package the rebates and do a, an instant rebate that goes to the contractor so the business doesn't have to worry about, you know, the, the cash flow, waiting for an incentive. Um, and then if they want to use one of our, they can use their own contractor if they want and do a kind of a do-it-yourself project. But if they don't have a, a contractor they want, we'll actually just route it to one of our contractors and kind of manage the project for them. So really all they have to do is say, okay, it's, it's worth it for me to do this and say yes, and we'll go through the whole process with them. Um, so... You know, implementation flexibility is another one that we're kind of dealing with a challenge there as far as um, actually continuing the flexibility we had in the previous round because we were pretty dependent on the, the kilowatt reduced methodology of being able to kind of go in and say, well, gosh, maybe we're going to do some delamping or we're going to switch to task lighting and not really taking just a, you know, a ballast swap out or, you know, a fixture to fixture, you know, one to one. Um, upgrade approach and really kind of looking comprehensively of how can we kind of package this project and, and take everything into account and make it pencil out and, and work for them um, and you know have a payback period that's a, a certainly a challenge you know we see if it gets more than two or three year payback that that's like project acceptance just drops off for small businesses that um, you know they just don't have that longer horizon you know some of them are like I don't know if I'm gonna be in business next year let alone five years from now so I'm not gonna make an investment that's a, a five-year investment and so that's a barrier that you know we're still working to address that that's your sort of limitation on their their payback horizons and on the flexibility side you know one factor is is just kind of slowly but surely with those foot in the door measures and kind of providing the the, the custom um, upgrades, building trust over time. And so like, for example, the Mad River Brewery, we've done, we're on our eighth round of projects with them. So it started with like, hey, an open sign and oh gosh, you've got some low flow uh, fixture opportunities. We can come back and do those. Um, oh, you've got a vending machine that we could put a vending miser on and then, you know, convince them to do a lighting project. And then after they did the first lighting project, they did another lighting project. And then moving on to more complex things, we did refrigeration with them, then we did a burner upgrade, you know, so they've kind of been nibbling away at all these projects over, you know, the last few years, slowly but surely kind of getting to that. And it's sort of a, 
it helps one with the trust side of it and them seeing like, oh yeah, that actually did pencil out. That actually did work for me. And that, you know, the, the, the technology was good. The lighting's better. Okay, let's try the refrigeration thing. Okay, you know, now we're doing compressors with them this year. And I, I would say that that eight project cycle was uh, due to the fondness of our employees for their services that they provide. But, I, but I, that's not the case because we've actually had the, the same result with lots of other customers where it's slowly but surely you kind of work through different projects with them. And then the, as far as the, the access to providers, we've really focused on um, building a contractor pool. So we've got that pool of local contractors and getting them training and working with local distributors. So they actually the products that are efficient are available locally. And so you know, that's been kind of an, an ongoing uh, piece, which really has been uh, positive for the, the sort of economic development. And that kind of helps sell it to the local community as well, is that we're giving work to local contractors. And, you know, and they become champions of the program, They're saying, oh, this is a way for us to get business and build customer relationships. So for them, you know, they've said, not only do we get the business you uh, send our way, but then we've got that relationship now with the business. And so they'll do non-energy efficiency projects or, or upgrades. Um, because they've established that uh, trust with uh, the customer that they're serving. So as far as the implementation, we didn't get there sort of overnight. We started out doing information only and then uh, began doing lighting only for the most part. And then um, we've really kind of expanded to do more refrigeration and, and looking to kind of broaden that to pretty much the whole suite of efficiency measures. Um, our Energy Watch budget currently is about $1.35 million a year, and that's split out into sort of time and materials and incentives. And so you can see that the time you know, out there, you know, a lot of it's just the, the boots on the ground outreach activities. And that budget is serving you know, municipal, residential, and also doing the strategic initiative kind of activities. Um, as far as the non-residential, we, we bucket municipal and, and business together as far as our, our teams. And so it's, it's about half or 60% of our budget uh, as far as time and materials of effort, but then it's the, the bulk of the actual savings we get just because residential's a lot more labor intensive and less bang for the buck. And as far as our, our implementation for our energy office, we've got, if you count interns, we've got about 20 staff. And the, the non-residential team is uh, two specialists, two technicians, and we usually have one to two interns and then you know, a share of kind of the internal back office support. So uh, the technicians are really the ones that are out there recruiting businesses, doing some of the freebie direct install activities, and then the specialists are managing the, the complex projects and working with the contractors to get those upgrades made. We've got about six to 10 participating contractors um, in any given cycle that you know, will we'll be getting those project referrals. So for 2010, 2012, we served 519 businesses, and they ranged, you know, from little mom and pop projects that were, you know, a couple hundred dollars up to some some fairly decent sized projects um, in the you know tens of thousands of dollars uh, incentive level. Um, the savings that 10, 12 cycle, we got about a million dollars a year in energy savings for for small businesses, and you know we we hit our targets, we exceeded our targets for for energy savings. I didn't put terms up there, but we also exceeded that one. And we did um, 502 direct installs, and about 306 of those were, were referred to local contractors. And that's where that economic development piece comes in as far as actually um, kind of stimulating the local uh, business sector, which is, is pretty popular with, with the local community. Um, as far as future, we want to kind of continue to, to uh, diversify and, and get into more complex projects and, and other offerings and you know, move beyond just low-hanging fruit and trying to figure out, well, how do we get past that two-year uh, payback period for, for more complex, deep retrofits. That's certainly a challenge. The local capacity building is also a challenge. We finally got one contractor that's locally doing refrigeration, but in the past we had to outsource the refrigeration to a Bay Area company because there was just no contractor that wanted to get involved. They weren't, they weren't comfortable. They said, oh, this is going to break and I'm not going to know how to fix it and I just want to do what I know. And so we finally got one, but that's kind of an ongoing to get to those deeper, more complex projects. And then looking to replicate it in the residential sector so we can have a similar model to get home upgrades done as well. So, thanks. So last but not least, we have Cody Hooven, who manages the Port of San Diego Green Port Program. She is also leading the development of a climate action plan addressing both the port's carbon footprint and well, as well as the adaptation to climate impacts, especially sea level rise. Cody works on various collaborative sustainability efforts in San Diego and statewide. I'm Cody Hooven, uh, and I manage, uh, as, as you mentioned, um, our uh, Greenport program at the port, um, looking at a variety of things, a lot of which is um, made possible by our partnership with our local utility. So I'm going to talk about um, this session as bright ideas and business outreach, and I'll share a lot of our bright ideas and, and also some of our not so bright ideas. Um, 
And this is the evolution of our green business program. So we started as a challenge and, and it evolved to a network. So I'll kind of walk through that process with you. A little bit of background on the port. Um, here on the, on the right in purple-ish is, is the port's jurisdiction. So we share um, jurisdiction with, or, or we have member cities, five different member cities, and a board of port commissioners that are representing those five cities. So while we're a relatively small jurisdiction, we're politically quite dynamic. Um, we also manage waterfront property in San Diego, so can, as you can imagine, that's of high interest. Um, and we're uh, established by an act of state legislature in 1962, um, and we're a special district or a local government. Um, let's see. So our operations, we're not a, a typical kind of large co cargo container port, as you would imagine, uh, like LA and Long Beach and maybe Oakland. Um, we our commercial real estate uh, property manager, essentially. We have two large cargo terminals. We also have a cruise ship terminal. Um, but we also have uh, ship builders, ship repair facilities, large hotels, um, all the way down to small marinas, small restaurants, um, shopping centers, um, 18 public parks. So we manage a variety of uh, property, and we have a lot of different tenants. Um, we have, the number changes constantly, we have about 500 tenants uh, or port tenant businesses on our property. And with sub subleases, it's even more than that. Um, another part of our mission is also to manage, uh, be an environmental steward of the bay and manage uh, natural resources. So um, we have a lot of different directives and a lot of things going on in our, in our little jurisdiction. So the Green Port program started in 2007, or it started as a policy, um, really to promote our sustainability efforts at the port. And um, as Jillian mentioned, we had a few, um, we have a few different initiatives, the climate planning process, we look at sustainable purchasing, probably a lot of things that have been talked about already at this uh, conference so far, um, and employee engagement. Um, and we um, started our energy efficiency partnership that really helped us to really beef up our internal activities in sustainability, but also to reach out to our tenants. Um, so we have a variety of initiatives that look at facility retrofits. This is all under our partnership. Um, exterior lighting, greenhouse gas inventorying, um, our operations, and now also our, of our whole jurisdiction, um, and education of port employees and employee engagement, and then now focusing on outreach to port tenants as well, which is the bulk of our missions for our jurisdiction. So we started the Green Business Program as the Green Business Challenge, and it was um, we, we worked with ICLEI to model after their Green Office Challenge in Chicago. Um, there's a lot of changes. Their, their Green Office Challenge, if anybody's familiar with that, was started in the downtown district of, of Chicago in very uh, kind of uniform, high-rise buildings, similar models, operating models. And like as I mentioned, the variety of our tenants, um, we had to really modify that program. But it was a good starting point, and, and ICLEI worked with us and was a great partner in that. Um, I also worked with our, uh, our port tenants have formed an association, and so I worked with that, kind of created a little focus group with them. Um, at, prior to that, that initiative, they had seen us and our department in the port as coming to regulate them or cite them for non-compliance of permits, so it was a, a, mind, a shift in thinking for them and for us to um, work with them on this voluntary kind of challenge to really engage them in, in doing something that just will help them and um, help us. So I worked with a lot of different representatives from different sectors in our um, Port Tenants Association and kind of had to get over that hump of, you know, we're from the government <laughs> and we're here to help you um, and say, no, really, we're trying to just do this to, to help you um, and worked with different um, uh, experts like the Green Building Council and things like that to, to get some, pick their brains and get some ideas of what would work for us. Um, and then looking at what, what would work for our program, obviously we thought it needs to be especially starting in 2009, 2010, it needs to be free to our tenants uh, and voluntary and also needs to um, be easy for them to, to um, participate. But we wanted to also have some quantifiable metrics. So it started with the free and <laughs> voluntary program, started in 2011, it's a one year program um, and, and as a challenge. And we opened it up to all of our tenants and subtenants. Um, they determined their level of commitment, they also set their own goals, so we broke it a, a scoring system down into tiers. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be in tier one to all the way down to tier four? And we made them all very, you know, positive. It, you know, they were all great to be in. Just being in the program was great. 
Um, we provide a lot of tools. We um, created an online scorecard that made it really easy to kind of go in and check boxes, and I think I'll show a picture of that. Um, and, and then um, in addition to that, that scorecard, we also had a series of trainings. We did monthly trainings for the businesses and tried to target it to things they may be interested in. And sometimes we'd only get hotels if we were talking about um, certain activities, or sometimes we'd get only marinas, but um, that was okay. We wanted to just try to make sure we, we reached everybody. Um, and one thing that we found was key to them, and I'm sure anybody that's engaged businesses, hello. No. <laughs> um, is um, to marketing them. You know, not only just getting um, all these tools and resources and training, but telling the public that these businesses are participating and how great they're doing and, and they're wonderful community members. So we had a scorecard, um, here, just as an example here, um, and, and it's a kind of a, a tool online that you just click easily, yes or no. This one, for example, is does your company have a green team, which is responsible for making off your office uh, greening fun and managing environmental initiatives. So um, we tried to make, a, we went through the scorecard and made sure that there was things that they could do that were free. You know, do you print double-sided, things like that that they didn't have to invest a dollar, they just had to maybe change some behaviors and they could still be successful in, in the program. Um, and if they happened to answer no or didn't know or whatever, they could click on help and resources. And we provided links to maybe websites or templates online, things like that, that they could find more information if they, if they were interested in that measure. So this is a process we shared with them was, first you register, you complete your initial scorecard, set some goals and then throughout the year participate in, in our trainings and different things and complete a final scorecard. And then we had an award ceremony at the end. Um, and we held a series, a couple of events um, besides just trainings throughout the year um, and a couple of substantial trainings. We did a certified energy manager training and lead green associate. And we were sure to tell them how much these trainings were worth. Uh, we tried to put dollars wherever possible. You know, this is a free training we're offering to you. It's a $200 value or, or something, so that sometimes they're, um, they can get approval internally to do this because it, you could show a, a benefit to them. We did this really cool, this is a picture of um, a green sharing event. We did kind of a speed dating <laughs> setup uh, where we had all the businesses come and, and sit across from each other and we set up some questions for them to share and we had prizes and, and fun things. Um, and, and that was a big hit. We had to actually force them to stop <laughs> speed dating. It was, it was great. Um, I'm not sure any love connections actually came out of that, but <laughs> energy connections were even better. Um, we did a bunch of um, PR. We, I have an intern who wrote little blog posts for the website. We had a bunch of videos made um, and just really tried to, you know, t talk it up as much as possible. Um, so we had 50 businesses participating, 26 small businesses, um, re reduced energy use significantly um, from those businesses. They also saved about $156,000 in their energy bills and about $134 were earned in rebates and incentives. Um, data mining is a little bit tricky for this program, especially because I'm sure many of you have worked with utility to try to get data and it's not always easy to, to refine it down as, l as low as you need to go or as, as um, as high resolution as you need. Um, and we also, let's see, reduced 843 metric tons. These are all metrics we wanted to really share on the website and press releases and things. Um, we looked at different strategies. We looked at different ways of summarizing results. We talked about how many new strategies were implemented, um, 377, what that number actually means. I don't know how relevant that is, but interesting number. Um, and they improved their score <laughs> from the baseline, their initial score, um, about 50%. So, and, and many of them achieved their goal and, or surpassed it. So it's really making them feel good about being part of the program and recognizing that. So then the transition, um, it's pretty intensive and, and I think as uh, my fellow presenters talked about, it's really a high touch activity. We really have to have an intern and a staff member constantly engaging these businesses and asking them repeatedly to get involved and then how you can help them and sit down with them at their computer to go through the scorecard and um, it's, a, it's a lot of effort. Um, so we transitioned from a challenge to a network, just um, in a way to try to make this more sustainable long term. Um, we thought the challenge term maybe made it seem really intensive the first year, um, and we wanted to just make it now be part of a membership and ongoing activities, um, and, and hopefully lighten the uh, workload on their end and on our end a little bit too. 
Um, so we just completed our first year of the network. It remains to be seen if we're losing participation or anything. We, we actually have more members signed up now, um, but we seem to, in the last few months, have seen less people coming to the trainings. So um, we're, we're going to try to figure out if, if, if that's working or not or what we need to do. But we reduced deadlines. Um, we made some improvements to the online tool. We continued the marketing benefits. Um, and so we'll see how that's going. We had one other huge success. We did an event called a Top Green Chef. Um, San Diego Gas and Electric has an a energy innovation center, and they have an um, energy efficient kitchen, demonstration kitchen. So we have a lot of local celebrity chefs in San Diego and in our jurisdiction. We did a Top Green Chef event. We had sustainable um, ingredients from the farmer's market and, and the local um, fishermen, and we had celebrity guest judges and, and um, had people cooking in front of you while people mingled and, and talked about whatever, hopefully energy efficiency, but whatever they wanted to talk about. Um, and it was a big success. It was a lot of fun. Um, we, we engaged a lot of different businesses than we would have before. And those that, that weren't really engaged, maybe invited, said, can you please do another one of these? We want to be a part of this. Um, so it really reached a different audience, which was, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so here's down to our lessons learned. Um, it's challenging to get results. Kilowatt hour reductions for this, this business engagement, especially in the first year or two, is, is really difficult to track and to sift out those numbers from, um, from other activities they're doing or things that are going on. Um, in the scorecard itself, it was also voluntary to disclose data. So um, we didn't get a lot of disclosure. Um, some of it maybe was um, we had a lot of discussions forming this program about Public Records Act <laughs> requests and if we're going to be sharing our data with you and you get a, a PRA request, there goes all of our proprietary information out to the public and um, a lot of fear there. Um, so we kind of switched and went to the route of asking sdg &E to, to gather data for us, but again, that's also difficult because um, of all the proprietary information there and, and just um, privacy issues. Peer-to-peer -peer information sharing we found is key, letting those businesses get together in a room and just maybe starting a conversation but letting them share ideas. We found the hotels, for example, are very competitive. So if we tell one hotel, hey, you know that the Sheraton's doing this, then they talk to each other and they try to out-compete each other. Um, we really have um, tried to leverage all the um, resource programs, like direct install and things. We, sh we funnel all of the businesses to those programs as much as possible. Um, one on one support is key. Um, recognition, I think, is key too. Um, we had a much smaller awards event this year, and we're going to try to figure out if that's th one of the reasons why we feel there's a little bit less participation. Um, and finding proper points of contact at businesses. We would have the facilities engineer involved, and if he got an email that was talking just about marketing, he he'd probably delete it instead of forwarding it. So really taking a year or so to get the right contacts and getting a list for each business um, was key. And just everybody is busy all the time. So finding a way to, to balance that um, with all of the things we're trying to do with the program. Um, let's see. I think that's it. Um, the next steps we have is in our region, we're trying to work regionally to um, kind of make some of this replicable, so create some templates for this. The city of Chula Vista is also doing a similar program. Um, the city of San Diego is interested, um, and we have some joint uh, local government partnership funding to, to create some templates and some rec replicability um, of this program. And um, having a spokesperson, uh, we have an organization called Clean Tech San Diego, trying to get them engaged to give it some credibility and say, you know, we think this is, these are great programs for businesses and we want to recognize those that are in it and just increasing participation and interest that way as well. Um, and I believe that's it. So there's our website, greenportnetwork.org, if you're interested. Uh, that's for just that program. It's not the Port of San Diego's website. I run a codes and standards program, and the key to what we're trying to propose for dealing with a lot of folks is almost all based on behavioral change. And I was hoping to hear it in everybody's, I heard a lot of it in Cody's, and I'm curious about um, how you've incorporated some of the behavioral change aspects into your program designs. And Cody mentioned at least six, and I stopped counting after that, from behavioral competitions to peer focus to guilting to reward systems. I mean, it looked like you covered the spectrum in this, and I'm curious maybe for you guys. Um, how you've either used those in the past or how you see them as part of your programs moving forward? Um, we've done actually a fair amount on the behavioral change side on the residential um, 
piece of it. And so we actually just um, are wrapping up an innovator pilot doing a behavior change program where we're going out and kind of having people make commitments. And we had like a school um, based sort of competition where we had prize money for schools to do energy makeovers at the schools. And so the team that won, you know, there was, so they had each school had its own team. And so um, I think the trick, the issue for us, I mean, so we're, we're very interested in that. I and mean, that's why we put together this innovator pilot. The challenge is right now that there's no way for like a direct install program to incentivize that. Like we, you know, we could get somebody to save huge amounts of energy from from behavior change, but we wouldn't get any you know credit for that. It wouldn't be quantified, and so there's that kind of mix of like, well, gosh, this could be a great activity, but it's not going to help us hit our energy target goals for the program, and that's where you know we've got to be focused on because we've got to you know actually deliver the the program results, and so I think. What we would like to see is ways to develop programs that actually could, you know, measure that and actually have it be verified and say, okay, you know, you can do behavior change programs and get, you know, energy saving credit that's going to be acknowledged by the CPUC as, as being delivered by those kinds of programs. So both for Energy Upgrade California as the campaign, behavior is a, is a big component of that. And we we set aside some of the funds in the proposed budget um, to do several kind of specific behavior pilots, uh, really kind of trying to, um, to drive some of the thinking around behavior so that we actually – to pilot some of these ideas and try to figure out ways to, to do them. Um, the, the Engage 360 campaign – um, you know, for, for all of the challenges that it had and from some of the challenges of the naming, it, it was actually, in essence, the largest scale behavior program ever attempted. Um, it was entirely behavior oriented. Um, and so it, in that, if, if, if there is sort of a, a tragedy in that program, sort of not ever getting off the ground, that's actually the biggest part of it, I think. Um, so we're not going to attempt to do that on the same scale because there were problems with doing it that way. Um, but we are going to have certain components of behavior in, in the campaign overall. Um, for CCSC, uh, other sort of broader um, outreach work that we do, uh, we do do a lot of work with behavior. Um, I mentioned the the sort of the the neighborhood programs and having homeowners and testimonials. We do a lot of work particularly with social norming and we really try to make very clear that there are that this is a common thing to be doing and and, and really sort of leverage peer to peer sort of pressure, if you will. Um, we find the social norming works really well. We've done some testing with um, loss aversion messaging and some other things that we know from behavioral research is effective. Um, we haven't really cracked that nut yet. Um, we did do a behavioral study, a behavioral pilot as part of um, ARA uh, in partnership with the city of San Diego. And what we were trying to figure out is um, if in-home behavioral uh, support basically would really make a critical difference in energy savings on top of upgrades. Um, we're actually still crunching the numbers on that. We partnered with UCSD, um, and I don't have data yet on that. But we are really trying to figure out sort of key components of behavioral work that we can track. And whether or not um, whether or not it's actually true credit or becomes part of the, the resource acquisition is, is a little far down the road for us from that perspective. Right now, we're just trying to figure out how do you really quantify it in ways that are that are useful. But we do a lot of different things, a lot of pledged things as well. So. Hi, I'm Stephen Ponsole. I'm with the Truckee Donner Public Utility District. Uh, I guess my question is mostly directed to Matthew. Um, we're not quite as remote and dispersed as you are, but we, you know, are more rural than the bigger cities that tend to uh, to have more capacity. And so you talked about the contractor network that you build, and my question is, what process did you use? Was a statement of quals? Are you going through a trade association? How do you maintain that list, avoid the, you know, you're playing God by steering business to this person versus that person? I'm curious how you went through that process. Yeah, so so we used a, a, an RFP process, and so we, we put it out there and said we're looking for, you know, qualified lighting uh, contractors and you know when we provided you know what the installation standards were and then what the the product lists were so we had you know product specifications and so their responses had to you know just talk about their minimum qualifications talk about kind of their process for um, quality control and kind of how they would you know implement the program you know as far as you know making sure that they were you know delivering results on time and how they would deal with you know, issues that arose or, you know, change order situations or, you know, kind of just overall how they would manage projects. And then they all had to, to provide um, 
bids on all the different uh, measures, which we're probably going to start moving away from that just because we're getting into more complex um, types of work. So it's less easy, you know, lighting, you can kind of say, okay, what would be your price for these kind of standard retrofits? And then we basically took the the group of bids and then deve- developed like a, a standard unit price list that they have to agree to. And so basically, you know, kind of taking the average or uh, of, of all the different uh, prices that we got, we came up with a list that then they all sign on to say, okay, we'll offer it. And so that lets us go into the business and go in and say, oh, if you want to work with one of our contractors, this is exactly what the price will be. This is exactly what the incentive will be. So, you, you know, you can kind of give them that, you know, easy upfront um, estimate and it, it eliminates a step for the, for the business. So, and then we've, we've kind of just repeated that um, each program cycle will, you know, kind of resolicit. Um, uh, contractor participation and you know revise the the measure list and the, the the price list hi I'm Gabby from the city of San Francisco doing a lot of outreach for businesses especially small medium and large uh, but mainly small I think the main challenge that we encounter in San Francisco is reaching out to businesses that are located in multi-tenant commercial buildings uh, we have tried grassroots, canvassing. You don't have access to actually enter into the building. Um, direct mailing as well. Sometimes the owner of the building lives in Idaho, you know, and it doesn't get to the property manager. So I want to know if you have any recommendations or insights about reaching multi-tenant, multi-tenant commercial buildings. Um, so we, we have some facilities like that, and um, we have a shopping center, for example, that has 70 it's kind of smaller businesses within that larger property, and they um, are managed by a property manager. And we really had to work with the property manager to they, – they have regular meetings to discuss whatever they need to discuss in their business, and we'll, we'll add, ask if we can get on those agendas and come in and, and um, advertise what we're trying to do and – um, another thing we tried to do with them, and, and this facility or the center ranges from a little sunglass stand to, um, you know, larger restaurants and things like that. Um, we've also uh, brought in um, the direct install program and kind of walked around. This is where interns come in handy. Walked around and asked all the businesses to please sign up and here's what it is and, um, and had the direct install company come in and um, just kind of do some of those retrofits to the ones that had um, been interested. And hopefully they talk to their peers there and say, hey, I just got some free lights, you know, and and, um, saving money. But some of the barriers that we ran into as well is that they don't pay sometimes their their, um, energy bill directly. Uh, The property manager kind of divides it out through some strange formula or, um, um, but having the property manager engaged for us has been the only way that this really works. Otherwise, they don't they don't have time for us. They don't really know who, who we are, what we're trying to do. And sometimes there's three people that work there, so um, they have a lot on their plate. I have all the answers, but that's what's working for us so far. Yeah, I would say the same thing. We don't, we don't have a ton of multi-tenant bones. We certainly, you know, we don't have high-rises or anything like that. But um, I think, you know, the the route that's often been effective is working with uh, property managers because they kind of buy into it and you know say, oh, this would be something that I'd like to see happen to my my properties. Um, then they can be a conduit to to get to the the tenants themselves. But obviously, if they're they're not receptive, then it's a it's a harder challenge. So. Right, a fellow PG&E program manager, actually, Kate, you're in the room, aren't you? Was just telling me a story about how it took her two years to find the property owner of an industrial park in Yolo County. <laughs> Um, and after that, they did a huge project. It was just finding the right person. Um, I did want to point out that PG&E did fund an innovator pilot program with the cities of Berkeley, Oakland, and Emeryville on the multifamily issue and the split incentive. And the findings are out. And Timothy Burroughs is at this conference. Is he here? Oh, you're here. So maybe you could talk to him, um, whoever asked that question, or the city of San Francisco representative. Sorry, Tim, for putting you out on this spot. <laughs> Any other questions? I had one that I'd like to ask to Siobhan. Uh, you mentioned um, at your tabling events, he used a word like interception feedback, or what was that? And that really piqued my curiosity, because I don't know about you, but I am surveyed out. I feel like every event I go to, I get a survey monkey or I get a comment card. And if there is an opportunity to get feedback more um, at the customer site or when you have that touch point, I think that would be great. So I was wondering if you could tell about how you do that. Sure. Um, 
Yeah. So the term I used was intercept survey, um, which generally just means, you know, survey people, stop them and survey them um, quickly uh, and verbally. Uh, And we've used that technique a lot. So I actually didn't talk about one behavioral program that we did. um, And it is one of our not so successful ones that we learned a lot from. So I'll talk about it for just a moment. Um, We, as part of the Better Buildings Neighborhood Program, um, we did a pilot geared at military families. We had an idea that we could try a CBSM approach and treat the military family community community throughout San Diego because we have a lot of military families um, and and retirees, so both active duty and retirees that do not, so active duty that don't live on base and then all the retirees in the community um, as a community and try kind of a CBSM approach. So really try to identify the barriers and the benefits um, specific to them and figure out if we could find a way to actually activate them to do um, to do home upgrades. And it didn't work um, really at all. Um, but we did a lot of intercept surveys actually. And, and part of the way we deployed the campaign, and this is really common with CBSM because of course that whole approach is really structured very specifically on figuring out the barriers. And intercept surveys are a great way to do that. So we actually actually uh, worked with a firm that um, did work on base and they would stop people and ask them a series of questions. And and the key to the intercept survey approach is it's got to be very short. Um, you can't, I mean, and it's not a, you don't hand them a questionnaire, right? So you have something that you're just tracking their answers on. Um, it's got to be pretty quick for you to track the, the responses and um, so that you actually can tally them and have sort of useful data. Um, But they are a useful tool and they're often used in the development of behavioral campaigns. So they're definitely worth looking at. Um, And uh, and and just a quick thing on the CBSM campaign. What we found is, you know, the barriers and the benefits were the same for the military families as they were for everybody else. And um, they were really cost conscious and we couldn't get them to really think about it in any other context. And that's really why it wasn't as effective as we had hoped it would be. So we actually transitioned it to a broader um, energy coach kind of approach. I was going to be your favorite moderator and let you out early for lunch, oh, but sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm Alex Portishover. I'm with the city of Benicia, and we have um, an existing resource incentive program for our businesses in our large industrial park. And we've tried to quantify what the economic impacts of that program are outside of the cost savings for each business. So whether that be business retention or job creation or um, we haven't quite figured it out. So I'm wondering if you've, if you've tried to model some of those impacts. I'm guessing that's for me first. Um, no. <laughs> Lunch? <laughs> um, I, I think that's a really interesting idea, and, and I'd like to maybe talk with you afterwards. Um, we have a few really large industrial uh, tenants that have energy teams and are really leaders on this stuff for the business case. Um, so I would have to maybe talk to them, and that might be a, a good idea for me. So. Yeah, we haven't specifically modeled that. I mean, one thing we do have is uh, testimonials from our participating contractors about, you know, how much work they get through the program and, you know, actually saying, oh, we've got two employees that we hired, you know, and that we're able to retain because of program activity. So we've got some some specific numbers, but not like the overall, like what's the, the impact to the businesses. And, and on the contractor piece, just as far as that question, if anyone's interested in like the nitty gritty details, I'd be happy to, to email, you know, the RFP and the, the contract template we use and the program participation manual for the contract contractors or any of that stuff. Great. And, and their uh, contact information are, is on the slide decks on your thumb drive, just so you know. And I just want to sort of speak to that more broadly, because we um, we struggle a lot with just all the various other myriad benefits, obviously. So people don't often do these things for the energy reasons. And of course, in our programs, we really have to track the energy reasons. Um, and so that's something that I think is part of an ongoing conversation. And there is there was a workshop, or there's one coming up at the PUC on social cost. Um, and I think that's definitely something to be thinking about, because it's true both in the business sector and the residential. And um, as we move towards true sustainability, these are, you know, it's it's an interdependent system, and everybody needs to be thinking about all of these aspects. So it's definitely a big challenge ahead. 